Science and Human Origins, Chapter 3, Human Origins in the Fossil Record. We've been going through the book Science and Human Origins, written by the, uh, printed by the Discovery Institute Press, and uh, written by uh, Ann Gauger, Douglas Axe, and Casey Luskin. This chapter today is by Casey Luskin. Um, the first chapter we went through is Science and Human Origins, and then Darwin's Little Engine that Couldn't. And then we had Human Origins in the Fossil Record today. And uh, still to come is Francis Collins' Junk DNA and Chromosomal Fusion. That's um, next week, uh, unless something else intervenes. And then finally, we'll discuss the science of Adam and Eve, which is a quite fascinating chapter. Um, the last part of the book is, by the, uh, is about the authors, and Casey Luskin uh, is research coordinator at the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. He uh, got a BS and an MS in Earth Sciences from the University of California, and then uh, studied law from the University of San Diego. He formerly conducted geological research at the Scripps Institution for Oceanography and has published in both science and law journals and has been interviewed a number of times. He's uh, um, one of the spokespeople for uh, the uh, Discovery Institute Center uh, for Science and Culture. He starts out his chapter with a little paragraph that says, hominin fossils generally fall into one of two groups, ape-like species and human-like species, with a large unbridged gap between them. Despite the hype promoted by many evolutionary paleoanthropologists, the fra fragmented hominin fossil record does not document the evolution of humans from ape-like precursors. That I think you can take as kind of the thesis or the abstract, if you like, of the chapter. His introduction starts out, evolutionary sciences, scientists commonly tell the public that the fossil evidence for the Darwinian evolution of humans from ape-like creatures is incontrovertible. For example, anthropology professor Ronald Wetherington testified before the St Texas State Board of Education in 2009 that human evolution has, quote, arguably the most complete se sequence of fossil succession of any mammal in the world. No gaps, no lack of transitional fossils. So when people talk about the lack of transitional fossils or gaps in the fossil record, it absolutely is not true. And it is not true specifically for our own species. And if you're wondering, that came from a recording that um, uh, uh, Casey Luskin has in his possession of what uh, Wetherington had to say in front of the Texas Board of Education. According to Wetherington, the field of human origins provides a nice, clean example of what Darwin thought was a gradualistic evolutionary change. So this is a success story in the mind of uh, uh, Ronald Wetherington. Uh, Casey Luskin goes on to say, digging into the technical literature, however, re reveals a story starkly different from the one presented by Wetherington and other evolutionists engaged in public debates. The fossil evidence for human evolution remains fragmentary, hard to decipher, and hotly debated. Now this is a Reader's Digest version. I have left you areas where I've kind of skipped over stuff. Um, the full chapter is a better read, but um, obviously we don't have time to read the full chapter. So um, that's one of the reasons for giving you the reference ahead of time if you want to read the entire thing. Um, the record reveals a dramatic discontinuity between ape-like and human-like fossils. Human-like fossils appear abruptly in the record without clear evolutionary precursors. The challenges of paleoanthropology. Paleoanthropologists face quite a number of daunting challenges in their quest to reconstruct a story of hominin evolution, that is, humans, chimps, and uh, all of their supposed ancestors. First, hominin fossils tend to be few and far between. It's not uncommon for long periods of time to exist for which there are few fossils documenting the evolution that was supposedly taking place. As paleoanthropologists Donald Johansson, that's a discoverer of Lucy, and Blake Edgar observed in 1996, 
About half the time span in the last three million years remains undocumented by any human fossils. And from the earliest period of hominid evolution, more than four million years ago, only a handful of largely undiagnostic fossils have been found. So fragmentary and disconnected is the data that in the judgment of Harvard zoologist Richard Lewontin, no fossil hominid species can be established as our direct ancestor. Lewontin, you may remember, is the uh, fellow who wrote uh, that we believe in science in spite of all of the difficulties involved because we have a prior commitment to materialism. The second cha challenge faced by paleoanthropologists is the fossil specimens themselves. Typical hominin fossils consist literally of mere bone fragments. As the late paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould noted, most hominid fossils, even though they serve as basis for endless speculation and elaborate storytelling, are fragments of jaws and scraps of skulls. Doesn't sound terribly definitive. A third challenge is accurately reconstructing the behavior, intelligence, or inf internal morphology of extinct organisms. Using a, an example from living primates, primatologist Franz de Waal, observes that the skeleton of the common chimpanzee is nearly identical to its sister species, the bonobo, or the pygmy chimpanzee, but they have great differences in behavior. These problems are intensified when bones are missing. A series of associated foot bones from Olduvai, that's where a lot of fossils are found, has been reconstructed into a form closely resembling the human foot today, although a similarly incomplete foot of a chimpanzee may also be reconstructed in such a manner. And uh, flesh reconstructions of extinct hominins are likewise often highly subjective. They may attempt to diminish the intellectual abilities of humans and overstate those of animals, giving the Australopithecine a human glint to the eye and making the Neanderthal look really dumb. Given these challenges, one might expect caution, humility, and restraint from evolutionary scientists when discussing hypotheses about human origins. And sometimes this is indeed found. But as multiple commentators have recognized, we often find precisely the opposite. And uh, apparently in the footsteps of Eve has quite an interesting commentary on uh, the political fights in the field. Now people know a whole lot more than the evidence would, would give them uh, the ability to see. Holden acknowledges that the primary scientific evidence, Holden is uh, Constance Holden, Politics of Paleoanthropology and Science. So this, is, this got through the uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, sieve. Um, <coughs> The primary scientific evidence relied on by, on by paleoanthropologists to construct man's evolutionary history is a pitifully small array of bones. When an anthropologist has compared the task to that of reconstructing the plot of war and peace with 13 randomly selected pages. According to Holden, it is precisely because researchers must draw their conclusions from this extremely pa paltry evidence that it is often difficult to separate the personal from the scientific disputes raging in the field. <coughs> the appearance of discordant evidence is sometimes met with a sturdy reiteration of our original views. It takes time for us to give up pet theories and as assimilate new information. In the meantime, scientific credibility and funding for more field work hang in the balance. There's a little financial incentive as well, and that's uh, Johansson mentioned above as the discoverer of Lucy. So it is worth a paleontologist's time to make one's own discoveries more important because that means more money. After interviewing paleoanthropologists for a documentary in 2002, PBS Nova producer Mark Davis reported that each Neanderthal expert thought that the last one I talked to was an idiot, if not an actual Neanderthal. 
<laughs> kind of an interesting uh, comment there. Uh, in 2001, Nature editor Henry G. conceded fossil evidence of human evolutionary history is fragmentary and open to various interpretations. So, and I've only given probably half the quotes. Uh, obviously, this is a, an area where a lot of people realize that there's a lot of ferment in spite of the fact that when they go to talking to say the Texas Board of Education, suddenly everything is very firm. And uh, that one is Henry G. Again, Nature, a, uh, again, this one got through the peer review hurdle. The standard story of human evolutionary origins. Despite the widespread disagreements and controversies just described, there is a standard story of human origins which is retold in countless textbooks, news media articles, and coffee table books. A representation of the most commonly believed hominin phylogeny is portrayed below in figure 3.1, and here's figure 3.1. And you can see that there's a couple of them very early, Sahelanthropus and uh, uh, Orion will come to that later. And then uh, Ardipithecus, which apparently came later, and the links between these is all, are all missing. They're imaginary. That's what the small dotted lines are. This is a standard belief that the relationship goes from here to Anamensis and then Afarensis and Africanus and Robustus. And then from Afarensis is supposed to be Homo habilis and then to Homo erectus and then to Neanderthals and modern humans. The evidence or lack uh, thereof often gets in the way of the evolutionary story. Early hominin fossils, the earliest hominin fossils are often fragmentary. And they note Sahel Anthropus chadensis, or sometimes known as a Tumai skull, which the Tumai skull has been called the oldest known hominin that lies directly on the human line. But not everyone agrees. There are many features that link the specimen with chimpanzees, gorillas, or both, to the exclusion of hominids. Sahelanthropus does not appear to have been an obligate biped. In their view, Sahelanthropus was an ape. And uh, uh, again, that's something they got through nature, so it's officially peer-reviewed and approved. Our results showed that the type of craniodental characters that have hitherto been used in hominin uh, phylogenetics are probably not reliable for reconstructing the phyl phylogenetic relationships of higher primates, species, and genera, including those among the hominins. Uh, or to translate that, it isn't good enough to tell what's going on. And again, that was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Fossils like um, Sahelanthropus show compelling evidence that our own origins are as complex and as difficult to trace as those of any other group of organisms. Um, the reference is given IBID, but if you go back up far enough, you'll find that that's from uh, nature. Orion to Genesis. Orion, which means original man in a local Kenyan language, was a chimpanzee-sized primate which is known only from an assortment of bone fragments, including pieces of the arm, thigh, and lower jaw, as well as some teeth. And um, um, there's a picture of some of the stuff. And if you're wondering why it's a drawing instead of a photograph, it's very simple. Nobody can sue you for a drawing. Photograph, on the other hand, uh, unless you get permission, uh, and if they don't like the book, the permission will come very expensive or will not be given at all. And just one of the realities of publishing in this kind of area. Some paleoanthropologists claim that Orion's femur indicates a bipedal mode of uh, locomotion which is, quote, appropriate for a population standing at the dawn of human lineage. But as later Yale University Press commentary admitted, all in all, there's currently precious little evidence bearing on how Orion moved.
Orion, simply too little of it is known at present to make confident claims about its locomotion or its proper place in the supposed evolutionary tree. Basically, we just don't have enough information. To move on to Ardipithecus rambidus, or is known as Ardi sometimes, Tim White had previously promised, the person who dug it out, uh, promised the fossil was a phenomenal individual that would be, quote, the Rosetta Stone of, for understanding bipedalism, end quote. And um, when the papers were finally released, the science media took it as an opportunity to evangelize the public for Darwin via Artie. And that's Artie. Not very much of him. I guess you get some of the face and uh, you get some of the teeth in the maxilla. The mandible is obviously missing. Back of the skull is missing. Um, Artie was discovered in the early 1990s. Why did it take 15 years for reports to be published? A 2002 article in Science explained that initially the bones were so soft, crushed, squished, and chalky that White reported, when I clean an edge, it erodes. So I have to mold every one of the broken pieces to reconstruct it. Um, and that's the quote. Um, the team's excitement was tempered by the skeleton's terrible condition. The bones literally crumbled when touched. White called it roadkill, and parts of the skeleton had been trampled and scattered into more than 100 fragments the skull was crushed to four centimeters in height. And um, you notice in the note, it went on to say the excitement was tempered, however, by the condition of the skeleton. The bone was so soft and crushed that White later described it as roadkill. How far should one trust claims about Artie as a Rosetta Stone for understanding bipedalism? when the bones were initially crushed to smithereens and would turn to dust at a touch. What I'm really interested in is um, how do you tell bipedalism from the face? I, um, I assume there must be some other bones that uh, somewhere went there. And I wish that um, that's one thing that I think I would have uh, tried to uh, uh, deal with in the book that, that uh, Casey Leskin doesn't touch if only to say that there are no other bones. And uh, as uh, John Noble Wilford said, I frankly don't think Artie was a hominid or bipedal. Skipping over a few other uh, paragraphs, later hominids, the Australopithecines. In April of 2006, National Geographic ran a story titled Fossil Find is Missing Link in human evolution, scientists say, which reported the discovery of what the Associated Press called the most complete chain of evolution so far. Sounds like it's still not quite complete, but the fossils belonging to the species Australopithecus animensis were said to be to link Ardipithecus to its supposed Australopithecine descendants. And. Uh, this is National Geographic News, which I guess shouldn't surprise anybody. And uh, then uh, MSNBC. What exactly was found? According to the technical paper recording the find, the bold claims were based on a few fragmented canine teeth, which were said to be intermediate in size and shape. The technical disruption, description used in the paper was intermediate Masculatory robusticity. If a couple of four million year old teeth of intermediate size and shape make the most complete chain of human evolution so far, then it does kind of suggest that the evidence for human evolution must be indeed quite modest. And that's the report in Nature itself. Besides learning to distrust media hype, there's another important lesson to be gained from this episode. Accompanying the praise of this missing link were what might be called retroactive confessions of ignorance. In this common phenomenon, evolutionists acknowledge a severe gap in their evolutionary claims only after they think they have found evidence to plug that gap. 
We've seen this in Tikalik, for example. Um, thus, the technical paper that reported those teeth admitted that, until recently, origins of Australopithecus were obscured by a sparse fossil record. We just saw the reference for that. Uh, further stating, the origin of Australopithecus, the genus widely interpreted as ancestral to Homo, is a central problem in human evolutionary studies. Australopithecus species differ mark markedly from extant African apes and candidate as, uh, ancestral hominids such as Ardipithecus, Orion, and Sahelanthropus. Skipping down a few more lines, a few more paragraphs. Uh, Australopithecines are like apes. While Sahelanthropus, Orion, and Ardipithecus are controversial due to the fragmented nature of their remains, there are sufficient known specimens of the Australopithecines to gain a better understanding of their morphology. Nevertheless, controversy remains over whether the Australopithecines were upright, walking ancestors of the genus Homo. The four most commonly accepted species are Afarensis, Africanus, Robustus, and Boise, and I should have italicized that. Robustus and Boise are larger boned and more robust than the others and are sometimes classified under the genus Paranthropus. And uh, the reference for that is the encyclopedia. By far the most well-known Australopithecine fossils is Lucy because she is one of the most complete fossils known among pre-homo hominids. She is commonly claimed to have been a bipedal ape-like creature which serves as an ideal precursor to the human species. And there's what's left of uh, Lucy. There are some reasons for skepticism over whether Lucy represents a single individual or even a single species. In a video playing at the exhibit, Lucy's discoverer, John, uh, Donald Johansson, admitted that when he found the fossil, the bones were scattered across a hillside where he looked up the slope and there were other bones sticking out. Johnson, Johansson's written account explains further how the bones were not found together. Since the fossil wasn't found in situ, it could have come from anywhere above. There's no matrix on any of the bones we found either. All you can do is make probability statements. Now, um, I will point out that there are people who have severely criticized Casey Luskin for writing this. They're pretty standard people. Uh, one of them is Nicholas Matsky who uh, was recently of the, uh, oh boy, um, Eugenie Scott's group, the, uh, yeah, it's, it's the uh, something, Center for Science Education, and I'm forgetting the exact name right now. Pardon? Yeah. Anyway, um, and they're saying that the um, quotes that he uses here and a few others that I've omitted are uh, actually um, talking about another scene. I don't know for sure. I thought it was rather interesting if that was the case that uh, the worst they could do is pick one uh, flaw in what Casey was pointing out and not all the other stuff. And it always uh, amuses me when people uh, major in minors in a situation like this. Skip over a few um, paragraphs. Moreover, many have challenged the claim that Lucy walked like we do or was even significantly bipedal. Mark Collard and Leslie Aiello observe in nature that much of the rest of her body was quite ape-like, especially with respect to the relatively long and curved fingers, relatively long arms, and funnel-shaped chest. There Article also reports good evidence from Lucy's hand bones that her species knuckle walked, as chimps and gorillas do today. And there are the references, both of them in nature. Mm. And there is uh, Lucy, the little one. And uh, you'll notice that 
quite a bit of her is missing and presumed filled in. Although it's probably fair to fill in a right femur, uh, to fill in a left femur that looks fairly similar. Um, and this is one of the more uh, Homo erectus type fossils. The dark is what we've got. The, 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 the actual bones are dark. What's missing is filled in by um, sanctified imagination. Um, <coughs> other studies confirm Australopithecine differences with humans and similarities with apes. Their inner ear canals, responsible for balance and related to locomotion, are different from those of Homo, but similar to those of the great apes. Uh, that's an interesting little thing, and, and why people are not paying that much attention to that when it makes all the difference in the world in whale ancestors is kind of interesting. Paleoanthropologist Leslie Aiello, who served as head of the anthropology department at University of College London, stated that when it comes to locomotion, Australopithecines are like apes, and the Homo group are like humans. Something major occurred when Homo evolved, and it wasn't just in the brain. And again, um, uh, that's uh, quoted in a, in a book, uh, and you'll notice that uh, we also have some comments on uh, that are fairly similar published in Science. A Big Bang Theory of Homo. If human beings evolved from ape-like creatures, what were the transitional species between the ape-like hominins just discussed and the truly human-like mem human members of Homo genus found in the fossil record? There aren't any good candidates. Many paleoanthropologists have cited Homo habilis as a transitional species between the Australopithecines and our genus Homo. But there are many questions about what exactly habiline specimens were. A specimen is, species is, uh, to quote one source, a wastebasket taxon, little more than a convenient recipient for a motley assortment of hominin fossils. Um, quoted, uh, again, passed through the peer review process, evolutionary anthropology. A 1998 article in Science noted that about two million years ago, cranial capacity in Homo began a dramatic trajectory that resulted in an approximate doubling in brain size. Um, that's common uh, in Science. Wood and Collard's review in Science the following year found that only one single trait of one individual hominin fossil species qualified as intermediate between Australopithecus, Australopithecus and Homo, the brain size of Homo erectus. However, even this one intermediate trait does not necessarily offer any evidence that Homo evolved from less intelligent hominins. As they explain, relative brain size does not group the fossil hominins in the same way as the other variables. This pattern suggests that the link between relative brain size and an adaptive zone is a complex one. What's probably more important is to note that uh, human brain size today varies considerably and uh, Homo erectus is on the lower end, but within the range of humans of today. <coughs> Likewise, others have shown that intelligence is determined largely by internal brain organization and is far more complex than the sole variable of brain size. Brain size may be secondary to the selective advantage of allometric reorganization within the brain. Thus, finding as few skulls of intermediate size does little to bolster the case that human evolves from more primitive ancestors. And it says, uh, see figure 3.6 below. We're going to see that in just a minute. Um, that's uh, a drawing of a whole bunch of human brain, uh, human skulls. These rapid, unique, and genetically significant changes are termed a genetic revolution where no Australopithecine species is obviously transitional. For those not constrained by an evolutionary paradigm, what is also not obvious is that this transition took place at all. 
and again they're they're quoting it's uh, I bid in this place but if you go back far enough it's uh, uh, Hawks Hundley Lee and Wolpoff of the various transitions that occurred during human evolution the transition from Australopithecus to Homo was undoubtedly one of the most critical in its magnitude and consequences as with many key evolutionary events, there's both good and bad news. I'm quoting from um, Lieberman, Peltbeam, and Rangham. Um, first, the bad news is that many details of this transition are obscure because of the paucity of the fossil and archaeological record. That is, they can't tell you what's going on because they don't really have enough material to say. As for the good news, they still admit, although we lack many details of exactly how, when, and where the transition occurred from Australopithecus to Homo, we have sufficient data from before and after the transition to make some inferences about the overall nature of key changes that did occur. <laughs> we can still make up stories. <coughs> The earliest fossils of Homo, Homo rudolfensis and Homo erectus, are separated from Australopithecus, Australopithecus by a large unbridged gap. How can we explain this seeming saltation? Not having any fossils that can serve as missing links, we have to fall back on the time-honored method of historical science, the construction of a historical narrative. And if you're curious as to who wrote that, it's Ernst Meyer. And the year is 2004. Not exactly ancient, and not exactly a dummy in the field. Just an amazing uh, point of view. We can always make up stories. Then, um, all in the family, in contrast to Australopithecines, the major members of Homo, such as Erectus and the Neanderthals, are very similar to modern humans. And we'll see the comparison in just a minute. Uh, they're so similar to us that some paleoanthropologists have classified Erectus and Neanderthalensis as members of our own species, Homo sapiens. And yes, there's a bunch of them that have done that. There's about five references when you sort through that. And here's the Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, which actually has a bigger brain than the average human, and Homo sapiens. The, we've got a little more of a chin, although I can tell you I've seen people that have the chin that goes back, and they're terrible to intubate, too, for what it's worth. <laughs> um, Indeed, in contrast to the Australopithecines and Havilines, Homo erectus is the earliest species to demonstrate the modern human semicircular canal morphology, previously noted as a fever indicative feature indicative of the mode of locomotion. That's the rest of uh, Spoor, Wood, and Zonnefeld's uh, commentary. Fascinating uh, that there appears to be a complete change in the semicircular canals, suggesting that humans walked upright, Australopithecines probably did not. There's also no intermediates for the semicircular canals. They're either one way or the other. That's, that's what uh, the, the, uh, their summary of the evidence seems to indicate. Anthropologists Stephen Molnar explains that the estimated mean size of Neanderthal cranial capacity is actually higher than the mean for modern humans. And uh, there is a reference for that. In 2010, Nature reported the finding of Neanderthal DNA markers, which we've been able to find De Neanderthal DNA, so we know what some of it was, uh, in living humans. A genetic analysis of nearly 2,000 people from around the world indicates that such extinct species interbred with the ancestors of modern humans twice, leaving their genes within the DNA of people today. And uh, if you're curious, that's Nature News, which is not quite um, nature. 
uh, but uh, probably has references. I haven't actually looked at that particular reference yet. But it's an interesting concept. The, the conclusion, well, virtually the entire hominin fossil record is marked by incomplete and fragmented fossils. About 300, three to four million years ago, we see ape-like australopithecines appearing suddenly. When the genus Homo appears around two million years ago, it also does so in an abrupt fashion, without clear evidence of a transition from previous ape-like hominins. Subsequent members of the genus Homo appear very similar to modern humans and their differences amount to small-scale microevolutionary changes. At the beginning of this chapter, I quoted SMU anthropologist Ronald Wetherington telling the Texas State Board of Education that the fossil record shows an unbroken sequence documenting our gradual Darwinian evolution from ape-like species. Were we to revise Wetherington's testimony in light of the actual evidence discussed in the technical literature, we might say that the hominin fossil record is anything but unbroken. There are many gaps and virtually no plausible transitional fossils that are generally accepted, even by evolutionists, to be direct human ancestors. Thus, the public claims of evolutionists to the contrary, the appearance of humans in the fossil record appears to be, have been anything but a, graduate, a gradual Darwinian evolutionary process. The Darwinian belief that humans evolved from ape-like species requires inferences that go beyond the evidence and is not supported by the fossil record. As I read this chapter, it seems to argue that one, the fossil record for hominins is fragmentary. Two, there seems to be no good transitional forms between apes and australopithecines, or I should say other apes and australopithecines, and between australopithecines and Homo erectus. There seem to be a good argument for regarding all Homo besides Homo habilis as fully human and Homo habilis is not dealt with in a thorough way, but I think that uh, um, I've seen other people do the same kind of thing, um, and I think that, that Luskin is probably right. I think that Casey Luskin does make a good argument. Uh, it's very similar to the argument of Marvin Luvenau um, in Bones of Contention. Those of you who have seen that book, and maybe we should come back around to that one of these days. Um, uh, one of the less known facts in Lubinow's book is that there's a four million year old shoulder uh, humerus that looks like a human humerus, but is classified as an australopithecine one because everybody knows humans don't go back that far. Uh, which is just a fascinating way of, of, dating th of, of naming things. It is less detailed, but in one sense more powerful than Lubinow's book because Luskin doesn't have an obvious theological motive for separating humans and apes. Um, if it is, fine. If it isn't, fine. Uh, as far as I can tell, no skin off of his particular nose um, in that he's not made any claims that humans can't have evolved from apes. He's just simply observing. You don't have the nice smooth sequence. You have uh, apes to begin with. You have australopithecines in the middle, and then you have humans in between all of them. There's a gap. Luskin not a Christian? I think Luskin is Christian. And wouldn't he have a theological motive? Um, no. Uh, yes, and the, if we can get started here, because we're almost ready to go anyway, and um, um, I think that's it's an important point. No, Leskin, Leskin's personal belief is in long ages, and maybe there are transitional forms, and maybe there aren't, and you go where the evidence goes. That's his view. So from his point of view, the theology is not pushing him, at least certainly not pushing him strongly. Now, if you wanted to argue that Luskin is an argumentative fella and that uh, he likes to poke holes in the evolutionary scenario, and if he finds one, he might poke holes when there really aren't any, uh, you could make that case. But you can make that case for anybody, uh, theological or not, anybody who has their own pet little skull that they found. 
has a reason for wanting to make it look bigger, both for personal aggr aggrandizement and for the funding that follows. So, uh, no, there is no theological driving of Casey Luskin, and that's an important point. Yes? You declare that he has no theological motivation. I have not heard him say that categorically. Maybe you have. I have not. I, I'm As reading partly between the lines because of what kinds of things he will defend and what kinds of things he won't. Okay. What I can uh, say is that I had a conversation with Casey Luskin at a time when he gave a lecture to the Adventist Forum in Chicago a couple of years ago. And um, he told me was something that I had not known, that he married a young woman from Loma Linda. Oh, really? She is the daughter of the Marais family, a South African family. Dr. Marais is a Loma Linda cardiologist. And uh, so Casey has a, a fairly direct connex connection with Loma Linda. So he must be familiar with with his wife's background and whatever that may represent to him. Yes, um, that, that leaves uh, two questions unanswered. One of them is, what is her personal belief? That and I, I we do don't know. know. I, it, I'd like to say that all Adventists are short age creationists, but I know better than that. <laughs> and uh, uh, number two is, um, you know, does that get into his own personal uh, viewpoint. You know, I mean, there are short age creationists um, in the Discovery Institute. Uh, specifically, Paul Nelson is. He's made that very clear. Um, but there are other ones who accept long age and who don't have a particular problem going from one species to another. Um, uh, Michael Behe, in particular, has said common descent doesn't bother him at all. It's just that it has to be assisted common descent because there's too much change. So from that point of view, uh, if let's put it this way. If Michael Behe comes out the, uh, tomorrow or the next day and starts talking about short age, it's not because of his theological bias. It's just not. I can add another comment on Paul Nelson, if I may. Uh, in conversation with him, uh, he was very interested to hear that I'm from Luma Linda. And he, he told me directly that he had fairly close family connections with Seventh-day Adventist Christians. So, uh, in fact, his comments expressed more than acquaintance, but rather some sympathy as well for what that is worth. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go just a minute and then we'll give you a chance to talk. Um, the book's conclusions obviously put a strain on standard evolutionary theory. Uh, Luskin has drawn the fire of several evolution defenders and I, I hope to get to that maybe in a final uh, presentation of you know, what the, what, how this book is looked at from outside of the um, uh, Discovery Institute from, uh, uh, from uh, um, evolution defenders in general. Um, Luskin's conclusions also, interestingly or not enough, are not congenial to old age creationism. Hugh Ross needs to have a difference between Neanderthals and modern humans, can't have them interbreeding because that is the place where God created and that's where Adam and Eve started in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, 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 if you push humans into Neanderthals, then uh, the humans go back too far for the, for the Adam and Eve story to make much sense to them. So they're, um, <laughs> they're not going to be happy with, the, with uh, Luskin's uh, observations. Uh, Ross's theology has to need separate Neanderthals from humans. If you don't have that, then, uh, um, well, for one thing, the last species was created um, whenever Adam and Eve happened. There's a number of different uh, uh, points on that. And uh, now we'll officially open it up for questions and comments. And um, I think there was one behind um, Wesley. 
and then uh, Ariel, and then we'll go from there. Go ahead and uh, just keep it. Well, pass you it back. Um, perhaps inadvertently raised the issue of the Discovery Institute as uh, an organization with a corporate persona and um, it's a little hard to escape that. I rather wish that the organization did not. It's been imputed to it by the media and, though, and adversaries. Still though, I guess ever so often it does have to be brought into the conversation. And um, uh, it turns out that for practical purposes, the Discovery Institute is really rather touchy about the existence of God with a capital G. I think we all know that. But uh, at this point, I'm going to ask a question, uh, hopefully to have it clarified, my understanding clarified. Perhaps some of you have um, studied into this in sufficient detail to clarify my rather muddled and befuddled understanding of where the uh, Discovery Institute stands. But um, didn't it happen that several years ago, four or five maybe, something like that, that um, the Discovery Institute and, as I recall, Casey Luskin, Luskin in particular, being with a background in law, uh, participated if they did not actually bring into court a suit rather comparable to a, an ACLU suit that um, involved an educational entity that was trying to name creation and God in particular and they brought these people, Casey Luston brought these people into court uh, contending that they should not use the name God and in essence put themselves on the same side as ACLU. The Discover Institute is in really a rough position trying to on one hand uh, promote intelligent design which cannot but lead to God and on the other to want to mention him even to the point of sometimes going into court to have God removed from the curriculum. Now, am I all uh, confused on that? Uh, it is very confusing. I'd looked into it online, spent a couple of days on it several years ago, and I wound up confused. Maybe somebody else has a clearer understanding of it. Well, we'll uh, give the floor to Ariel Roth here, and I think he may be able to clear up some of that. Well, uh, this stance of the um, Institute um, stems in part from the principle of separation of church and state and uh, the idea that uh, you cannot teach creation in public schools because it is religion and so in order to try and get around that uh, many uh, have attempted to state well uh, yeah well we just look at the science and we will not invoke God in the picture and uh, we'll just say there's some intelligent design here uh, and in order to avoid any implications of religion because of legal and three times the United States Supreme Court has ruled on this that uh, no you cannot teach creation public schools because it's it's religion you're establishing religion and the Discovery Institute has been labeled as creation, even uh, though they the believe in long ages, most of them. Uh, they, they try and avoid, you know, and, uh, they, they try and avoid that. It, it's just, this is a, might call, uh, this is political expediency, uh, using the term political broadly, uh, trying to fit a, a little bit of this creation into a non-religious mode simply because we have this principle of separation of church and state. Uh, all this vanishes completely when you start looking for truth. I mean, so what if it's religion? What if it's so on? We want truth. 
Uh, we respect science. Materialistic information is, is good. It's interesting. It's true. We respect it and so on. But we're not going to close our door to this simplistic view. And uh, I say the Discovery Institute and so on and others, that, that's fine. Uh, they can look at that and so on, but they are not allowing themselves to be free. What, what if a personal God does exist, a God that sustains nature at present and so on? Uh, they, they close that door. You cannot find truth when you close doors. Uh, we need to be open, and I, I think from, from a logical standpoint and so on, uh, uh, a more open approach certainly uh, carries uh, the day if, if you want to really find what is true. Uh, that's all I'll say about that question. I wanted to make one comment here about uh, this time issue. Uh, I think one can make uh, an argument, and it is not a very strong argument, but it is one there that uh, if time has been in the millions of years, as they suggest, and uh, I think we too readily accept the geologic column, uh, the details of the geologic column, uh, and that uh, this has not been thoroughly studied uh, by us, per se. Are all these uh, relative levels correct uh, that, you know, Lubinow accepts and all of Because we have, you know, reevaluation involves a lot of work. Uh, but, uh, you know, at times uh, we're, we're creation is criticized because, hey, uh, where are all your antediluvian men? Uh, and uh, it's true, there's a paucity of that. But I, I think one c can argue to a certain extent uh, the time issue is a little more difficult for the evolutionists, that is for the creationists, in terms of the potential growth of, of human population and so on. Uh, you know, we're doubling, uh, well, you know, every 50 years, 30, 40, 70, depends on what data you go by. <clears throat> we're doubling so fast, uh, cemeteries are getting full and so on. Uh, there's no question human population grows tremendously. Why is it that fossil man is so rare. It doesn't fit the time scale. I think, I think we can say it. Uh, that, that point seems to be in favor. You can present all kinds of reasons uh, for this and so on. So it's not, I don't feel it's a very strong ar argument, but I think uh, it is a point that can be made that if man has been here for 500 million, if you want to say, uh, I mean 500,000, uh, if you want to say that figure, more, cons uh, more liberal million years and so on, uh, the Earth at our present rate of population should have been filled up m many times over. Uh, we're, we're, we're just, uh, our human population is just growing at a tremendous rate right now. So I think there's a challenge there, a time challenge to that, and uh, uh, raises the question about these dates. I would like to come back to the Discovery Institute. Um, I have talked to some of them. I've read some of their works. I've seen them presented in public. Uh, uh, Dembski is definitely Christian and tries to put uh, things into Christian perspective. Behe is Christian, specifically Catholic. Um, Berlinski is a kind of uh, agnostic Jew, I think you'd say. Um, Most of them acknowledge that what they're doing does, in fact, have implications for God. And I have not seen them ever sue anybody to try to keep God's name out of any school situation. They have advised that it's probably not a good idea politically to try to put God back in schools because the Supreme Court will shoot it down as establishment of religion. Uh, and they're right about that because the Supreme Court has done that. So they are not anti-God by any stretch of the imagination. 
nor are they in court anti-God. I have never seen anybody that, that uh, where they sued people to try to keep God's name out of, of schools. Um, rather, their emphasis is to look at the scientific results and saying it took some kind of intelligence. And if you want to put God into that, you can. If you want to put some alien race, you can. Um, they just don't, they don't want to have kids taught specifically that because as soon as you say, and it was so-and-so, and particularly if it's a theological so-and-so, the courts are going to come down on you. It's that simple. Uh, in fact, right now, they're not even advocating that there was some intelligence that was required. Right now, what they're advocating is to argue that there are pluses and there are minuses to Darwinian evolution. Evolution without any kind of guidance. And just leave it at that. Uh, and again, that's, that, is a, that is a political position they're taking. It is not a personal position and should not be interpreted as such. And it's advice they give, and I've never seen them sue anybody over not taking that advice. Does that help? Yes, it does. I appreciate that. Um, I think I got my information. I got my information second or third hand from a blog, from a blog, from a blog that had um, had seemed to ca uh, specifically state that the Discovery Institute, Casey Lusk in particular, had indeed participated in a suit, but that you would be in a much better position to give me authoritative information about that. And if you say they haven't, I understand why they would advise uh, parties against inclusion of God in curriculum, in particularly in public schools, even in certain private schools. That is pretty obvious and well known. And uh, I think that certain, uh, by the time the rumor uh, gossip had gone around the web several times, it had actually come to the point or been stated as uh, a truth that the Discovery Institute had indeed participated. But if you can assure me that they haven't, I, I, um, would, I appreciate that very much. Um, well, I just might add, you know, uh, I'm much more comfortable with uh, saying there is a God. Uh, he wrote the Bible. Uh, this is where I come from, uh, and uh, not worry about this artificial separation. When you start separating knowledge, you're getting into trouble. Uh, so, uh, separating church and state and so on, you can regulate your education on the basis of that. Uh, this is no way to, to go if you uh, want to be open, academic freedom, and uh, an open search for truth. One thing that can be said about the approach that they're using now is that there are two states, uh, Louisiana is one, and it's either Tennessee or Kentucky, I think it's Tennessee, but I could be wrong on that, um, that have enacted laws that require, uh, that, uh, that require no punishment for a teacher who teaches strengths and weaknesses of evolutionary theory. That doesn't allow them to bring in creationism into the classroom, but it does allow them to say an evolutionary theory is weak in this area and not get punished for it. And I think that given the intellectual climate of the ruling class in the United States, that's probably the best way to go at this point. Uh, I'm a little bit a little bit confused because there is a document that says all men are created equal and then uh, uh, children every time they uh, you know they look at the coin it says in God we trust now 
Those children must be as confused as I am because if they ask a question, why do we trust in God, the teacher cannot answer. Or if, if he or she asks, why do we say that all men are created equal, the teacher must remain silent, otherwise go to jail. I mean, this is, am I crazy or something, somebody else is crazy at the, at the Supreme Court? Well, maybe if you'll hand the microphone over here, you can get the word of an experienced teacher. You can answer questions like that. It's called a teachable moment. So a bumper sticker this morning that said, on which day did God create the fossils? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. I have stood in awe. About the 50,000th day, but go ahead. I have stood in awe in many museums before fossils. I love to see those tremendous dinosaurs. But on a geological field trip a couple of years ago, we stopped at a dinosaur factory where replicas of dinosaurs are made for museums. They look real to me. I was impressed. This chapter disturbed me. There's a lot of deception in this chapter. The man who composed Lucy could have composed her in any number of ways from all the fragments that were in the area of which he searched. And the man who spoke in Texas, I'm not as kind as some of you, that man is either abominably ignorant about fossils or he is a liar with an intent to deceive that'll have ramifications for a lot of children. That man ought to be tested electrically uh, to see if he does in fact know some truth or whether he has, is, he's being funded by a book industry or something. The, the, the fossil evidence is not going to get us anywhere, uh, uh, hominid fossil evidence. I just wanted again the uh where we can find it. Science and Human Origins online, free. Um, do you get the email? Yes. It um, it's, uh, has been the reference for the last three times. It'll be the reference this week if you've deleted all the email and it's gone. Um, I just look, look long enough to see what's the next subject coming or, up. Or you I can come. Google Science and, and Human Origins okay. and it'll probably pop, pop up. I think that's how... Uh, Jeff found it for me to begin with, and um, thanks, Jeff. Um, and uh, you know, he found it, I think, the old-fashioned way, just by Googling. And now uh, President Obama and his minions know that Jeff uh, uh, is interested in uh, Discovery Institute books as well. I thought he looked. Um <laughs> Um, can we pass that over there? I thought it was pretty bold for the author to just outright say it was based on lies. When I was growing up, I, I had a nanny who would say, now why are you telling me stories? Which was a euphemism for lies. And he said, this gives more room for stories. Well, what's even more interesting is Ernst Meyer saying, uh, we don't really have any good evidence in between here, so we'll just tell a story that will make it fit. I think it's a great euphemism. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a joke, but yeah, I'm afraid it's much easier to just believe that God created and pass it over. Yeah, Sean. Now, I should probably point out that it's a little bit past uh, 11.30, and I know some of you have places you need to be, but we'll continue the conversation for those of you who can stay for a little bit longer. I think he did get it wrong as far as Lucy's concerned. Lucy Skeleton, as far as I've read, and I've read quite a bit about Lucy, uh, was found all in one spot. The, the um, story that he found a knee bone from here and a, and a thigh bone from there and all that, 
that was with regard to a different skeleton, not Lucy. Uh, so he got that wrong, as far as I am aware. Uh, Lucy is, uh, is, I believe, all fits together. It's from one animal. Um, and also, Lucy is not the only ostropithecine that's been found. There's been lots of them that have been found besides Lucy. The only question I have with Lucy is all the features of Lucy fit a tree-climbing ape, not a hominid, not, not a pre-human. I mean, knuckle-walking, the semicircular canals for all the ostropithecines that, that have semicircular canals to analyze are all in the uh, prone posture. They're not upright posture. And I think the spores work on the semicircular canals mm -hmm. is the most damning evidence for hominid fossils out there. It's just, to me, co absolutely conclusive because there's such a strong dividing line in the, in the nature of the semicircular canals to uh, dictate posture. And this is in face of all the stories that are out there about how this animal walk upright based on the frame and magnum and all that stuff. All that stuff is completely opposed to the semicircular canal evidence, which uh, to me is a lot more conclusive, a lot more scientific. But um, the argument that Lucy's bones were found in different areas, I don't think that's true. I think that, that she is an intact animal. I, I have not yet. I've, I've been busy doing everything else that I've been doing, which, some of which is trying to cut down that uh, chapter to size. And so um, what I'm trying to do uh, after we get done is we're going to go into some controversies. There is a chapter, um, uh, the chapter by Anne uh, Gauger at the beginning that has been criticized, and we'll see what the, we'll see what the criticism is and whether it holds water. Uh, I'm of the opinion that mm -hmm. our arguments should uh, be as carefully tailored to truth as possible, and that if we discover if there's one that really doesn't fit, that we should say, yeah, I think you're right about that, and say, you know, ignore these three paragraphs in the book because they're based on inadequate and inaccurate information and we'll move on from there. Uh, but then I'm accustomed to taking care of people who don't tell me everything and then later on I get a little extra story and suddenly everything makes sense and uh, I adjust the contents of my note to uh, make sure it's as accurate as it can be. Um, and uh, nobody sweats a bit the fact that when the person came in, the information that I had was incorrect. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, you just correct the information and move on from there. Um, whereas I think that the people who are attacking Casey Luskin over this want to see and see, you did a bad job there, and so everything else you say doesn't matter, which is, of course, bunk. Uh, Coming back to this uh, Discovery Institute and uh, their stance and so on, I, I appreciate the Discovery Institute uh, and to the extent that they have challenged atheism, uh, highly commendable and so on. I uh, regret that this separation that they try to, to make, and I understand it very well because it's politically expedient that they do this, uh, is what got the people in Dover in such dire straits when they uh, tried to misrepresent themselves as having no religion whatsoever, and everybody knew they did have some religious motives uh, type of thing. And this really, uh, you know, was embarrassing to a certain extent for creationists in that position and so on, I think. It's always better to be, uh, have a high uh, level of integrity and be honest of what your beliefs are. Actually, the people that got most in trouble, as I understand it, were the Dover uh, school board people, because those are the ones that flat out lied. And once you lie, your credibility is shot and nobody believes what you want to, and the judge gets angry that you're not telling the truth and tends to lean towards the other side just because he's mad at you. Mm -hmm. I think that was a mistake. I was just thinking a, a little bit on the lighter side, 
thinking about um, stories that kind of help put things together. Every time I kind of think of that concept, I think about Forrest Gump, you know that movie? People ought to see it again. But it was a completely fictional character put into historical settings. And, and the whole script weaved this thing around to, to tie everything together. And it was just, I think it's just incredible how they did that. And I, I see this happening, you know, even in science. I, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's okay to do that as long as you don't take that as evidence. And as long as you're willing to say, you know, we have a hole here. And you're willing to say that not only in your article in Nature, where everybody is listening who knows that if you <coughs> say something that's beyond the evidence, they can criticize you, but also you say this in front of the Texas School Board where nobody really knows for sure. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, if they want to have a theory and that's fine and they want to present the evidence they have and they don't want to oversell it, uh, and then we can discuss the evidence. But what's happening is that people are, people on both sides, unfortunately, are fudging what they really know to be true. And that's sad. Uh, yeah, you, you know, we need to uh, often make a greater distinction we do between theory and fact and so on, very much so. But uh, sociology tends to come into the picture at times, and uh, uh, we tend to have group beliefs that uh, we don't all test. And uh, I think we're dealing with this to a certain extent with the scientific community. It's not a question that they're, they're just being human beings, and uh, they're uh, just following their fellow scientists and so on. Uh, who uh, tend to be materialistic uh, in their conclusions. Uh, but uh, remember alchemy, for instance. This dominated for years, uh, had a tr profound uh, effect on, uh, years, centuries, I should say, a profound effect on uh, uh, thinking, uh, witch hunting, uh, affected, I mean, this society tends to do this. And I, I think uh, evolution is uh, another case of this, although it seems to be almost pervasive, more pervasive than those other ideas. Uh, but uh, it's not, this is human behavior to a certain extent, uh, and certainly it betrays objectivity. Well, um, if you're looking for a good summary of the evidence with references to dig further, you could do worse than Casey Luskin's chapter. Uh, the one caution that I would give is I think that his treatment of Lucy is perhaps a little overly skeptical and may have gotten some misinformation in with it. Um, we'll try to go over that in a uh, final wrap up when we do uh, finish the book. and. Um, and uh, at the same time, we deal with the uh, questions that have been raised about and Gauger, which I think are probably a good bit more superficial, uh, just judging from what I've read so far. Uh, but uh, next week, if you're interested in the DNA evidence on um, uh, human-chimp uh, relationships, come on back. We'll have some more fun. Um, and then uh, eventually, I think the next one after that is particularly fascinating one about what about Adam and Eve?